American Gene Technologies was founded back in 2008. Uh, in 2007, I met a guy named Roscoe Brady, and I was retired in the computer industry, so I actually lived in Silicon Valley for about 30 years, and I still have a home in San Carlos. And uh, now I'm living out in Maryland when I started this company, but I had retired, and I got bored, if you can imagine that, in my 40s. And, and then I thought, okay, I'll just dabble in technology. I've uh, done pretty well in computers, software, internet, investing in real estate. You know, I was there during some real big booms in the real estate market. And at, at about age 42, I realized I didn't have to work anymore. And at about age 47, I thought, I, I realized being retired isn't really all that fun. It's not very stimulating to the brain, and I was looking forward to just dabbling in technology. And I thought I'd go back into computer again. Uh, I understood them pretty well. I thought maybe I'd sit on a board, maybe I'd invest a little money in a company and mentor a, a new CEO or something like that. But as luck would have it, I get a business plan over the transom from a lab at the National Institutes of Health uh, and from a person's lab guy named Roscoe Brady. It wasn't, it wasn't Roscoe who sent me this business plan, but somebody in this lab. They introduced me to Roscoe. Roscoe introduced me to viral vectors. Now, what are viral vectors? Everybody has heard of viruses around here, especially right now in the news. I'm amazed there's nobody wearing a mask in here. It's good for you. I'm not quite at that stage yet, but uh, it is uh, certainly making a lot of headlines these days. So viruses basically are these little capsules, you know, these little nanoparticles. If this room was your cell, maybe a viral particle would be about a little bit bigger than the size of my fist. And, but it's very powerful because what it has inside is a common DNA. It has the ability to attach onto a cell and then release that recombinant DNA into the cell. And what is a cell? The cell is a nucleus and cytoplasm. I'm, I'm way oversimplifying it for all your bio people. But you, know, you can think of a cell as like a factory. You can think of the nucleus as the factory uh, manager's office. And inside the factory manager's office is a safe that holds all the instructions for the factory. It's called DNA. And the, the manager just sends out copies of the instructions all day long. right? And the instructions go out as messenger RNA to the machinery of the cell. And the machinists aren't that clever. Whatever instruction they get, they execute. And this turned out to be really valuable back in the 80s, right here in Silicon Valley, right? When Genentech realized that they could drop the common in DNA for human insulin into the food of a vat of, of cells, cultured cells, shock them, they would uptake that instruction and start spitting out purified human insulin. That was when people with diabetes moved from bovine insulin to human insulin because they found out that these cells that had never made insulin before were capable of making insulin, you just had to put the instruction in there. So what they discovered is that your cells are much more what we call plastic, much more flexible. They can be reprogrammed even once they're fully differentiated. If you put a new instruction in there, they'll do something new. Now, later, they started thinking, hmm, and Roscoe Brady was thinking this, viruses do this in fully formed human beings. They basically carry recombinant DNA. They do the same thing. They, instead of having to be a, a, a cultured cells, it could be a human being, the virus will infect the human being, and they drop recombinant DNA into their cells their cells will be hijacked to do something new, right? What's that new thing more like? Reproduce the virus, right? But it doesn't have to be. And that's what viral vectors are all about. But you can take a deadly virus, you can now crack it open, you can scoop up the recombinant DNA and throw it away. What do you have left over? You have a delivery mechanism that can deliver anything. You have an empty stealth bomber that's capable of bringing new software, new instructions into your cells. And you, you heard me say software there. To me, this is just like software, right? Your DNA is your operating system. The DNA is the same in every cell, but your manager knows which part of the DNA applies to each one of those cells. And he executes it like that. The virus comes along and throw, throws things in that look just like the normal instructions. Most of them just dump it into the cytoplasm, right under the shop floor. And instead of uh, doing the normal function of the cell, 
the machinists start turning out copies of the virus until finally it runs out of materials and the cell falls apart and it goes on and infects other cells and so forth. But there are really clever viruses that don't just dump things on the shop floor. They actually sneak across the shop floor. They break into the manager's office. They pick the lock on the DNA safe and they just slip some new instructions in there. Those are called integrated viruses, right? So integrated retroviruses, perfect example of that is what? HIV. HIV, when it infects a cell, it actually bolts new uh, genes directly onto the DNA. And then when the manager wakes up in the morning and he starts looking for instructions, these instructions are tagged as this is for yourself. So it does all its normal stuff, but it also starts sending out these instructions. And so, till the day that that cell dies, it'll be slowly executing the instructions from the virus. In the case of HIV, it will be slowly creating the infection that will eventually take over your whole body and render you, your immune system uh, ineffective. Right? That's called AIDS, acquired uh, immune deficiency. So if we crack open HIV and we throw away those three genes in there, the genome of, of AIDS, the packaging signal, and the envelope instructions, there's no more instructions on how to make HIV hormones. What we have left over is, like I said, a cell farmer that can not only deliver new information to yourselves, but it can actually bolt it into the cell and make a permanent change to your DNA. In other words, we're converting viruses into updates for the operating system of your cell. This is a great way to look at viral vectors. And when Roscoe Brady told me about this, he may not have solved the history. My hand practice big story. I was like, wait a minute. This is the future of pharmaceuticals, right? We can now go and, and play around with the root drivers of everything in your body, literally everything. And there's more to it than just the fact that we can infect you and put new DNA in. It turns out that we can go ahead and attach something called a specific promoter to any DNA copy. So if you can that we're going to install into your DNA, we can put something called a specific promoter that's like an if-then switch. It's popular, right? It will only turn on the construct if the condition of that if-then switch is satisfied. And what can the if-then switch look for? any enzyme or protein in the cell. And we can use those enzyme and proteins that are present to detect a certain cell type. Like if you wanted to, to go to your liver, we could go ahead and we could have it look for albumin. And albumin is mostly in your liver, so that structure will only turn on in your liver. Or we could do something like have it look for HPSA, human prostate-specific antigen. If there's high levels of human prostate-specific antigen in a cell. It's probably got prostate cancer. So we can have things that only turn on in the case of the disease. We can also take that envelope. Remember we have this, this stealth bomber that is essentially a virus, hollowed out and refilled with something better. We can actually put half-chain antibodies on there and it acts like monoclonal antibodies attracting that viral particle to cells that have a proliferation of a certain receptor. So that's another way that we can target it. Now, why do we care about the targeting medicines? Because this is all new, right? When you take a aspirin, where does it go? Everywhere. It's the ultimate uh, democratic drug. It treats every single cell the same way. And what's a good drug? Something that does something positive and not too much negative. And what are the negative things normally happen? In off-target healthy cells, right? If you could tune drugs to only go where they're needed, you could ratchet up the power of these things, and you wouldn't have to worry about these things falling out of the clinical uh, development process out of human trials because of adverse events. Adverse events are basically when you get an unexpected result in healthy tissue. Right? <laughs> what if you could make a cancer drug that only turns on in cancer? Wow. You could how to deliver something absolutely deadly to the cell, right? Because if it wouldn't turn on in a healthy cell, you wouldn't have to worry about a chemotherapy that was killing the wrong cells in your body. 
that's what it's about. It's about raising the, the power level, but narrowing the effect so much that you now have these drugs that can do tremendous things in your body without having the same level of side effects that protect your healthy tissue from the effect of the drug. Okay, so what can you do with these things now? So we never have this ability that we can take these viral particles from the fluids we make one, they're not replicating. We actually duplicate it. These are like little diskettes. Each one's a little nanoparticle with one dose of recombinant DNA attached to your cell. We're using lentiviruses made from HIV, so it integrates. And we actually will replicate these up so that we have about two to five times the number of these pills as cells we want to infect. And why is that? Because these things are perfectly infectious. So we need more and we hope to get somewhere around one copy on average per cell that we're treating. So what can we do with this? Who's heard of monogenic diseases, inherited diseases? Okay. Just about everybody. What those are is if you get a broken gene from both of your parents, so you have two broken genes, one on each uh, set of chromosomes, then what will happen is that something that those genes were supposed to make won't be made. And what that causes is a loss of function disorder. The absence of that enzyme or protein, because that's what these cells generally are making, or the absence of the functionality of those genes, causes a disease that is based on that you no longer have that function. So what if you're born with something like that? That could range anything from lactose intolerance to gluten to spinal muscular atrophy, which would be deadly. Born with spinal muscular atrophy, uh, you never learn to sit up, you keep your neck straight, and eventually you can't breathe any longer and you die by age two. Totally deadly, one broken gene. What if we could just find that gene, put it into a hollowed out HIV, let the virus, make enough copies of it, and get it into your spine where you needed it? <laughs> well, once you're making the protein or enzyme again, the disease would go away. And actually, that's been done. So a company called Avexis actually made a cure for SMA, and they sold it to Novartis for $9 billion. It cost $2.1 billion for the drug. But it sounds ridiculously expensive, but guess what? If you're born with spinal muscular atrophy, the insurance companies are gonna pay $2.1 million for you to die. It's not like you just expire like this. No, you're, you need help all the way to age two. You have no life. So this is an investment in your future, right? It's cheaper to keep you alive, it's cheaper to cure you. So don't let anybody tell you that this stuff is too expensive. Because the reality is, is that being sick is expensive. And uh, treating people that are sick for life uh, is not free. So a lot of these things are basically cured because if we go ahead and install that gene that you're missing in the cells, it's a permanent fix. For the rest of your life, it will make that enzyme you are missing, and as a result, what was causing the disease is gone, so the disease is gone. So that's one thing that we can do, and there are 7,000 monogenic loss of function disorders, and they're called rare diseases, and even though they are rare, when you collect them all together, one in 10 people has a rare disease. If you don't have a rare disease, you're actually pretty lucky, or don't have somebody in your family with a rare disease. Some of them, like I said, aren't that serious, they require treatment or whatever, but you can have a relatively normal life, but other ones, are quite serious. But you know how much money the healthcare system spends on those 7,000 diseases, just uh, giving them palliative treatment, and we're just keeping them comfortable until they die? Two to four trillion dollars per year. The whole drug market is only one trillion dollars. That gives you an idea that there now, with this idea of viral vectors, with something as simple as just putting one gene that you're missing in your viral vector and getting it to the right cells in your body, we create these monogenic diseases for life. One and done cures. You return to a normal life. So, you know, that is a opportunity for a gargantuan expansion of the entire pharmaceutical market, right? Right now everybody's complaining about the price of pharmaceuticals, but the reason that they're complaining is because they're buying drugs that do almost nothing for huge high price and they have no options, right? Most Pharmaceutical companies have these monopolies in different areas, so they have a hostage audience of patients. 
and their profit maximization strategy is just, you know, lift the price a little bit every year. And, you know, that profit goes to the bottom line. But it doesn't have to be that way. Because in software, where I come from, where I come from, there's multiple ways to do any anything, any one problem. There's competition in the software market, and this is a market that's going to be very, very competitive. Because you guys could leave here, and I think within 10 years, you'd be able to get everything that you need in your garage to start working on a, on a, uh, a rare disease. And if you can cure a rare disease, and I think that the cost of going all the way through clinical trials on some of these rare diseases are going to be in the 10 to $20 million range. Even if you have an audience of, say, 500 people that are going to go blind without your drug, that's a profitable market, right? Plus, it's profitable by actually improving people's lives, which is really fulfilling. So, monogenic diseases, we've got one, it's called fetal ketonuria. And what fetal ketonuria is, you're born without a fetal alanine hydroxylase gene, and so you can't metabolize phenylalanine, which you probably see the warnings on the Coke can, but it's also in all animal proteins. And when you can't metabolize it, it builds up in your body and it destroys your nerves and your organs. So kids that are born with phenylketonuria can never eat animal protein. They have to eat their protein some other way. But anything that is broken down in your body is broken down into something else. And it turns out that phenylalanine is broken down into critical chemicals for your brain. So it doesn't even matter if you stay away from these animal proteins for life and you don't get that pain of the nervous disorders and the organ failures that come from the buildup of phenylalanine. You'll still be depressed by age 20, schizophrenic by age 30, and having suicidal thoughts by age 40. So it's a real slow, you know, deadly disease. And one in three people will commit suicide with a female pizza by age 40, not having been able to work for 10 years over a decade. So it's a serious disease, one broken gene. So it turns out we've made a drug. You just put a very small amount of it in and you irrigate the uh, umbilical vein and you can squirt the vector, the viral vector. It looks like uh, clear fluid. It looks like a saline solution. It's a very small amount of it because there's a lot of particles in the teeny little test tube, maybe you know, billions of particles even. And you can either do an arthroscopic surgery and go into the uh, the portal sinus and put this in and it goes into the low oxygen region or you can go right through the umbilical cord we think and you just put enough of this in the low oxygen region of the liver they start making enough phenylalanine hydroxylase the disease goes away they're normal for life and guess what you know how much it costs to maintain these patients now about 150 to 250 thousand dollars per year and remember once they have these psychological so they don't have a normal life anymore. So they need all this extra care. So this is, we could go ahead and make that much viral vector for less than $75,000. Even if we charge $400,000 for that, the insurance companies would be saving money and people would be living good lives. This is the case for all these monogenic diseases. Each one will have some sort of like engineering tasks that you have to get by. All of these have special challenges. How do we get enough of these viral particles to the right part of your body so that you get what's called therapeutic levels of expression. You're getting enough of the enzyme and the protein in the right place to mitigate the disease. Okay, but the basic science is rock solid. That it's all about these viral particles that reliably deliver into the clinic. And this is happening right now. How many people know that there are seven gene and cell therapies already approved in the United States? Way to go. Let me go down through them. So uh, the first one was a cure for blindness. How do you like that one? So it turns out one of the monogenic diseases you can get is called uh, Leber's congenital amaurosis. So you're missing one gene in the eye, you don't uh, refresh your light sensitive proteins, and somewhere in your teenage years you go completely blind because you run out of the protein. So that's pretty serious, right? Three drops of this drug that was made by a company called Spark that's now been sold to Roche, uh, of a adenovirus vector into both eyes will restore that protein. And I'm telling you, blind people are seeing it again. I mean, this is you know, just incredible. What's that worth? Right, it costs 800 and 
fifty thousand dollars to get both eyes done, but you can see it, right? There are people that were blind that are now driving cars or hitting baseballs. It's remarkable. So this is really powerful stuff. Then there were two car T's. Car T is sort of the other end of the spectrum of gene and cell therapy. What they do is they take gene therapy is this whole idea of just changing the genes in a cell. Cell therapy is the idea of taking cells and making them into the drug themselves. Right? So how would you do that? In the case of, uh, of this CAR T product, they go ahead and they do a leukophoresis of your blood, uh, of your blood. So they withdraw. I'm not sure how much you might need about the T cells from about three liters of blood a lot. And what you have is just a concentration of T cells that could be for anything, right? You have T cells that are are hunting for um, flu. You know, five different versions of the of the flu. Like each one of them have a different T cell. All these different versions of the cold, certain bacteria. Some of your T cells even actually hunt for cancer. And they're all steered by an antigen receptor, like an antenna on the T cell, which attracts it to the pathogen. And when it senses the pathogen, it becomes cytotoxic. In other words, it goes into kill mode. And it's a highly effective killer. So once that antigen receptor is triggered by the matching protein on the pathogen that it's looking for, it will kill the cell. So somebody clever at UPenn figured out, hey, what if we pull out these T cells? They have one antigen receptor. Let's bang a second antigen receptor onto them with a viral vector. They were able to design a genetic construct that made all these cells grow a second antigen receptor that was targeted at B cells. So why would you want to do that? Well, because if you have a leukemia, it's a B cell lymphoma, right? It's a, a B cell carcinoma. It's a, if you have a normal leukemia, it's curable through radiation or chemotherapy. But at some point, it can become what's called acute, and then there's no cure for it. So 100% death rate. Well, by doing this and creating these T cells and putting them back into the body, so the T cells are like the of the drug, you put them back into the body, they have to kill every B cell in the body, and so they take all the cancer with it. And 60% or more of these terminal patients are going on and living normal lives, going back to work, going back to pay taxes, whatever. So this has been a very effective way to get these really uh, extraordinarily deadly leukemias. There's two CAR Ts that have been approved in the United States. I wasn't personally in, in that excited about CAR T because I thought it was taking a sledgehammer to the problem. We've been looking for ways to treat cancer that doesn't eliminate all your B cells or all the cells in your body, right? It just kills the uh, malignant cells, just the cancer cells. And we found a way to do that, which I'll describe in a minute. So that's like taking cells from your body and using gene therapy to turn them into little bots to do something that they were never designed to do or never evolved to do, right? So you can make these like new functions of cells and that's sort of the extreme end on that side and there are two drugs that utilize that. And then in the middle, there's something else, just improving the operation of existing cells. So what if your cells don't quite do the job that they need to? Like what if you have HIV? Well, the problem with HIV is that you have HIV T cells. Everybody in this room has HIV specific T cells. A T cell that evolved to hunt down uh, HIV virons and destroy them. The only problem is, is that the HIV viron has evolved the capability that while it's being destroyed by the HIV T cell, it can grab onto the T cell, merge with it, and implant its genome inside that T cell. <coughs> So the first T cells that run to the infection to try to start the whole immune cascade to prevent HIV from getting into your body or taking off, they're the first ones infected because they're the first ones to show up. And they're, uh, as a result, they become, instead of your protector, they become the beachhead of the infection. And for the rest of their lives, uh, they're just putting out virons that can slowly collide with other T cells that are hunting for it. And that's why it can take up to 10 years before you realize that you have HIV. Because all the rest of the T cells in your body have to get random collisions with these HIV 
virus in order to get infected. But once enough of them get depleted, then some cold or flu comes along that you no longer have T cells for, and it turns you can't fight it off. It turns into pneumonia or something like that. But it all boils down to that initial meeting between the HIV T cell and the viron, and the fact that the viron has an advantage that it can infect the T cell. But we can take that advantage away. This is what I mean by making the cell better at what it should normally do. So we have a construct that we can put into any HIV T cell that makes it completely impervious to any HIV viron. So you can see why that would be useful in this group, right? We could go ahead and we could change all your HIV T cells and you never have to worry about HIV for your whole life. But it turns out it would also work on somebody that's HIV infected. Right? So there's no reason actually to you know, pre-immunize on this for the cost of a gene therapy or a cell therapy. But if somebody has HIV, once they're on antiretrovirals for one to three years, so there's a pill that people take and it suppresses the viridium, so much so that the virus can't move from cell to cell, then what happens is, is that your normal immune system re-emerges from the bone marrow. So all of your T cells come back, including your HIV T cells, which were the first ones destroyed by the virus, right? So now you have HIV T cells again. We do a 400 milliliter leukopat, so less than a blood donation. We put it in an automated machine for 11 days, and it makes a, uh, a dose of your HIV T cells that are completely immune to HIV, and that the quantity is about 10 times what you normally have after you clear the normal virus. So when you clear the flu, you usually have about 100 million um, CD4 positive uh, disease specific T cells. So we're making about a billion of these things, which is still a small quantity for your body. We put them back in, they completely clear the body of HIV. And they keep you immune for life because you have memory effect. They actually will go back into the bone marrow and they can reemerge really quickly if HIV comes back, which is very important because HIV can hide all over your body. So it can take a long time for your T cells to clear it. But this keeps your viremia low. And why, why is this a benefit? It's really important to get HIV infected individuals off of antiretroviral therapy. And the reason is, is that it's a chemotherapeutic. It has lots and lots of side effects. It goes all over their body. It does the job of holding down the viremia, but it makes them nauseous every day headachy, fatigued, and once they are taking this for years, they start getting early aging, bone density issues, osteoporosis, liver, kidney, heart disease. As you know that somebody that's infected with HIV, uh, not only you know is feeling nauseous most days or you know a little bit out of it, but they start to accrue damage to their body. It costs insurance companies fifty to eighty thousand dollars worth of doctor's visits every year. So the twenty or thirty thousand dollars that they take with drugs to suppress the viremia is just part of the story. So you're talking about hundred thousand dollars a year. Well, it turns out it only costs us hundred thousand in cost to cure an HIV patient. And we've already submitted what's called the investigational new drug document to the FDA. That's the final safety data that you give to the FDA to get permission to test this in humans. And the data in uh, when we were constructing this process to take somebody's blood and convert it into blood that's immune. The data of that, uh, doing HIV challenge tests in that blood, was so remarkable that NIAC, National Institute of Health, Allergies and Infectious Disease, came to us for a collaborative research agreement because they wanted to see if they could reproduce that data in their own lab. They wouldn't believe it until they did it themselves. And they've done that, they got the same data, they already wrote an article on how this is going to impact HIV treatment. So we think we've got this cure. We think we're going to go into the clinic in the next probably three to six months, as the FDA is getting their uh, final I's dotted and T's crossed on the data that we gave them, but we don't see any showstoppers in the questions that they're asking. And we think we have a really good shot at curing HIV. Moving people, 1.1 million people in the United States are infected with HIV, only a quarter of them take antiretrovirals, the rest of them are contagious and the rest of them get AIDS. 
and we the infection rate in the United States is between 30 and 50,000 new infections per year. Polio is only 60,000 infections per year at its peak in the United States. That's an epidemic. And about that same number of people are dying. Fortunately, some of them now from old age, they actually were on this uh, viral suppressive therapy and lived to a normal uh, lifespan. But not a normal life. It's very important to get these people back to normal. When your immune cells are doing their job, suppressing the viremia is, is easy. And so these people are walking around with their viremia so low that they're not contagious. They feel perfectly normal because the viremia is so low. So they're not, it's not like they're battling the cold or anything like that. And the Benny is, they're immune for life. So even if they go back into a community that's high risk, they can't recontract HIV. So this is a really a benefit to the insurance companies. It's a benefit to public health. It's a benefit to these patients, obviously, and it's not that expensive. We think that, uh, you know, we're talking to Gilead right now, and we'd like to sell them this drug uh, once we show that it works, which I, you know, I believe might be this year. Um, they might sell it for $500,000. That would be a low-end gene and cell therapy. But the savings to society and the benefit to the patient is immense. So that is a really fantastic opportunity, and that hopefully will be the, something you'll see from us later. Or, uh, on the news or even just in the government on social media and keep updating on the status. But that's just the beginning for AGT. Because when AGT was founded in 2008, I thought about this as software, right? We're putting new software in your body for better health. I think of this as the software industry for the next 100 years. If you've been born in you know, 1950 and you started programming in 1960, regular computers, they're all programmed in zeros and ones. You would still have job security today. That's because the computer industry is still taking off. There's still more things to do in the computer industry. I think molecular biology is the same thing today as computers were in the 50s. Anybody that can work in this area of software for the human computer, the human cell, we're gonna be creating value, improving health, uh, curing diseases for the next hundred years. I think that this is a much bigger industry than the computer industry. It's all programmed in ACTG, right? The nucleotides of your DNA. Base four, base two. Other than that, there's so many parallels. This computer is more sophisticated than a cell phone or a desktop computer because uh, this thing works in the things it's made of, right? And it collaborates electrically, chemically, it can even physically bump cells and things like that to communicate. So what you are is a stack of a trillion or roughly three trillion uh, networked organic computers that make up everything about you. And we are learning every year more about what causes disease or even what causes health, what keeps you healthy, all those things. So once we're done curing diseases, We'll move on to, you know, I mean, it sounds dystopic in a way, but you know, you'll come in for headaches and you'll go out, you know, having, uh, uh, you know, they will have gotten rid of Alzheimer's in your genes or Parkinson's or whatever. So I think that this thing is, you know, almost unlimited. But let me tell you how we're addressing cancer with this. It has to do with this concept that I was telling you is that I looked at this as a software industry. If you wanted to be really contribute to the world in the computer industry or the new software industry, the new computer industry. And, and you were thinking, what's the long game in this? How can you really dominate this industry? You might go back and look at the last software industry. Right? Who dominates there? Microsoft and Apple. Why is that? Platforms. Platforms have never been thought of as being important in biotech because biotech has always been about random discovery. When you discover a drug, you sometimes they have what they call a platform, but it will generate 10,000 random molecules and screen it down to one or two that are worth testing in a mouse. And one in 500 of those will actually make it into the clinic. So it's really just random discovery. When you're talking software, you're talking about deterministic stuff. We know if we put genes into your body, what pathways it will affect in your cells. We can predict exactly what it's gonna do. We can design to a specific effect. And because we can target it down so much, 
and not have to worry so much about side effects. And because everything you learn about programming this disease sort of relates to that disease, right? Once you know how the, the lentiviral uh, vector moves around the body and how it affects things, you know that for every drug that you do. And most of the drugs are the same. The same lentiviral particle with just a little bit different software in the middle of it. So it really is like a diskette for the human computer. We have this ability now to design and uh, and what we're seeing is that we never get a failure between the Petri dish and the mouse. And this year, we to show that we're not gonna get a failure between the mouse and the human. And given that we've developed these cells and we've been able to test them so extensively, ex vivo, uh, you know, before we put them back into people once we get approved uh, by the FDA to do that, we have pretty good confidence that uh, we didn't really see any technical difficulties from the mouse all the way to this human product. It really worked just like we expected it to. And that's the deterministic nature of, of software. So what did we set out to do in 2008? What I said is we need to be the most efficient developer of software for a human computer. Sure. That means having tools and components. Yeah. Yeah, so I have one question. So when you say that we can code the software in, in terms of the viruses, but with the with the normal software, we are like we have a very defined outcome that if this happens, then do this. If this doesn't happen, then don't do this. Maybe something that. But how do you make sure with the virus? You can't have like an alternative code in the same virus that if this doesn't happen, then do something like this. The software isn't as sophisticated yet. Right now, all we have is do this and an if on front of, on the front of it. That's, but there's a lot of low hanging fruit in there, right? We can, uh, just with, with that, we can direct these drugs just to the right organ and produce just the right enzyme in that organ and mitigate the disease. So yeah, you're taking my software metaphor, you know, you're extending it. And I think ultimately that will be true. You will be able to hang if then statements together and you'll be able to make if then else's. But so far, what we have is the if then. <laughs> But you can do a lot with it if then. So let me tell you how we're curing cancer with an if then. So what we found out is that everybody also, again, in this room, has something called type 2 gamma delta T cells. And they are an unusual T cell subset that surveils your entire lifelong for epithelial malignancy. So what is that? Breast, prostate, lung, liver, colon, kidney, ovarian, pancreatic, head and neck, and skin cancers, and some others. Some of the most deadly cancers that takes about a thousand people a day in the United States, those types of solid tumors. And your gamma delta T cells, if they're healthy and you're relatively healthy, they will eliminate all the small malignancies in your body, which we all have, by the way, and it's not a big deal. We're constantly eliminating malignancies from our body. That's what these T cells do. And they will keep you clear. They will eliminate them when they're small, so they never grow into anything big. You'll never even realize that you had cancer, and it will never be a threat to you because it will never turn into a solid tumor that might endanger you. That's what these cells do their entire existence. And remember I told you that you have different types of T cells for every type of pathogen you might encounter in your life? Well, you also have ones for diseases that, have never been on, that haven't been on the planet in 2,000 years. And you have other ones for diseases that never existed. You have random ones. So there's a ton of diversity in that. Yet three to five percent of every T cell in each one of your bodies just eliminates these malignancies. They're busy all the time. And they will keep you clear. And most people live their entire life without getting a epithelial solid tumor. But what happens when you get a solid tumor? Well, my guess is, and you know, I'm not a physician, but what I would guess is that accrued stress on your cells, you get more malignancy. Accrued stress on your body and aging and your immune system goes down a little bit and maybe you get a little bit of escape. So you have two cells that grow together and the gamma delta T cells don't get over there fast enough and then you turn to four and eight. Pretty soon they're blowing up like a balloon. Now it's too much surface area and the gamma delta T cells can't get back on top of it. They can only eat so fast. Well, here's what we discovered. We can take a small amount of viral vector and we can place it in just the primary tumor. Now you know that normally when people get solid tumors, after a little while they'll start getting secondary tumors or metastases, right? They'll, they'll spread out in their body. We only have to locate the 
biggest tumor, primary tumor. We put viral vector in there that reprograms about 20% of the cells to secrete a stimulatory smaller molecule called IPP. Well, it turns out that what that does is it attracts every single gamma delta T cell in your body to that site. It trains it, it proliferates them, it'll actually increase your number of gamma delta T cells, and it activates them. When they're activated, they can eat at 300 to 600 times their normal rate. Now, gamma delta T cells are incredibly safe because they have two different receptors. They have this antigen receptor called the gamma delta chain. That's what gets them up to for certain things. But then they have an NK receptor, which is capable of, of sensing a very complex set of stress molecules that's indicative of malignancy. So these things only kill when they come in contact with malignancy. They can be attracted and stimulated by stimulating that antigen receptor, that gamma delta chain. But they, no matter how active they get, they won't eat anything but cancer. So what we're seeing is this. We go ahead and we put that into the primary tumor in an animal model. Of course, these activated gamma delta T cells obliterate that tumor, but they keep circulating around the body while they're chewing away that tumor, and they eliminate the secondary tumors and the metastases and unrelated epithelial solid cancer, solid tumors. So in other words, if you came in with a lung tumor and I treated that lung tumor, it would get rid of the secondary tumors from the lung tumor, even the metastases, but it would also get rid of if you had a little breast cancer or a little prostate cancer that you didn't know about because these activated gamma delta T cells would be essentially flushing your body of these cancers, like rewinding your cancer clock, like backing up that time frame, right? We can convert cancer into a chronic disease. You get a solid tumor, we treat you, it clears you, you might be clear for five to 10 years. You get another solid tumor, we treat you again. And, uh, you know, these things aren't going to be that expensive, much cheaper than dying. And we could literally extend people's lives and we could make cancer something that is no longer dead. And it wouldn't, you wouldn't need surgery, right? Because we need that primary tumor for the site of immune response. That's where we create this immune response that activates your gamma delta T cells against all your cancer. And you don't need chemotherapy and radiation because your gamma delta T cells are perfect at clearing just the malignancies and not touching the healthy cells, which means that radiation and that chemotherapy that can do so much damage to your body can be avoided. I think that you're going to see, this is a project we're doing with Stanford, actually. You've heard of that school. <laughs> <laughs> the, they're, they're, they're second tier school, but you know, <laughs> they're worth knowing. Anyway, a uh, guy named Dean Felcher is an expert in hepatocellular carcinoma. We think we'll test this in 2021, maybe in the next 18 to 20 months, that we'll actually test this in liver cancer. And we'll take a completely fatal cancer to ensure that we can get rid of all the tumors that way. And then we can extend that later, once we show it's safe in liver cancer, we can extend it to any type of solid tumor. I'll get right to you right after this. We will we'll be able to, you know, start going into instead of fatal tumors, maybe things like breast cancer, which can be way overtreated, right? People find out that they have atypical ductile hyperplasia or ductile carcinoma in situ, which are basically pre-cancer and pre-pre-cancer. But what do they give everybody who gets that? Surgery, radiation, chemotherapy. Same thing they give you for invasive cancer. It's an overtreatment of it, but you're trying to be safe. But instead, you know what we could do? It's all in the duct. Just put a little viral vector right into the ducts. We'll just sweep that right up and you watch it. We have our collaborator at Georgetown University that's looking at it in breast cancer. And we think this is going to be effective. And we've already shown that it works on liver, breast, and prostate cancer. There's no reason that it wouldn't work on all those epithelial cancers. And ultimately, we think this could completely change cancer therapy. Yes. Does this still work in cases where the primary tumors are even excised from the body? Well, you could go to the secondary tumor. And, yeah. So you you wouldn't want to take out the primary tumor. And in the case of liver cancer, quite frequently they know it's going to be fatal. So it's it, it's really just a kind of um, you know they're they're 
it's a Hail Mary to give you a treatment, right? What they do is they fish a, uh, a tube into the liver and they squirt out something that kills one of the lobes that has the primary tumor and they hope it has the rest of the tumors in it as well. It's infrequent that that's the case. So that lobe is gone, but your liver will regenerate and you can live on just two lobes out of three. So, you know, that is a very, very, very low chance of success. So this, instead of squirting out something that poisons part of the liver, we just squirt out a little bit of viral vector and it goes straight to the cancer and lights it up and the natural immune system just runs in and chews it away, including the metastases and things like that. So you wouldn't want to remove the tumor, but uh, you know there's always some large tumor that you can put it into. Anyway, I guess I'm running short on time. I know you guys probably have studying and stuff to do. Um, you know, our plan is to go ahead and keep making essentially components and reusable uh, pieces that you can mix and match like an operating system that can cure a myriad of diseases. So all of the things that we develop for curing HIV, guess what? You can use that exact same process to cure hepatitis B, HTLV, human papillomavirus, herpes, Epstein-Barr, CMV, and all these other chronic viral infections that when they reemerge from the body, they can be uh, painful or even deadly. And now we have a process that's all done. All we have to do is change the target T cell and the modification and all these other things that we develop. They basically get us 80% of the way there to curing all these other chronic viral infections. So it's really a platform. We have all these components that went into phenylketonuria. We've been doing experiments on about 20 different diseases, monogenic diseases, and finding out what all these things have in common and learning how to reliably express things in the right place to cure monogenic diseases. So that will be an explosion of that type of cure. And then this cancer cure doesn't just work on one type of cancer, it works on many. And we'll be able to target other types of cancers like blood cancers and utilize your amidala T cells to go after the blood cancers or glioblastomas. So that has a lot of future in it as well. So we're trying to be the Microsoft of this industry. And when you look at some of the other companies, what you'll see is they discovered one thing that worked in a mouse instead of learning the basic fundamentals of trying to accrue a big portfolio of um, different uh, innovations and components and patents that you know, would give them a big future in a wide area, they just said, wow, well, this is biotech. As soon as you find something that works in a mouse, you take a $100 million bet and go into the clinic. If you win that bet, you're rich. And if you lose that bet, you're back to square zero. But that's biotech, right? It doesn't have to be anymore. Drugs can actually be and that's happening. So drugs don't fail. They actually don't work exactly like you expect. You take them back, you tune them a little, and try them again. It's a very cheap process. And so there's going to be a lot more success. Yeah. So to use your technology metaphor for viral vectors, um, you know, you're saying essentially uh, as a platform, the virus is kind of like the first PC, right? How do you know, or how confident are you that you were the first PC rather than the Commodore 64. And then what would you see next? Or how do you know that you're not the first calculator in the slide? Yeah. Okay, so, um, well, first of all, I don't look at viruses as being a platform. I look at software components as being a platform. So if you have a technique to uh, filter down T cells to a specific type, you have a patent on that. And you have a component that can be used in cell therapy. If you have a patent on uh, all the mechanisms for stimulating these gamma-delta T cells, then you have a platform that can go across many things. I think of viruses as being the paper tape and punch cards of this new computer revolution, right? I know that diskettes are coming, CDs, DVDs, way better viruses will come along and even better ways to modify your DNA that could be chemical. When somebody in this room may invent a chemical way that would be cheaper than making viral particles that can make the same modifications to DNA uh, in the clinic, right? And so, you know, we don't know how people will be communicating this software in the future into your body, but we know that the software is important. And AGT sits at the nexus of all this discovery in systems biology. How does your body work? How do diseases work? All of this discovery in genetics, Right? What are the genes that affect those things? 
and this area of viral vectors, these tools for editing your DNA. We don't think of ourselves as being in any one of those worlds. We think of this as a planetary collision and we're right at the middle of it. We're always just looking for low hanging fruit. We understand what our platform can do. We know what components we have. We do a lot of reading and we find out, oh, they just discovered that this is the mechanism of that disease. Hey, that would be really easy to get to with our platform. Voila, low hanging fruit where we can create value. Reminds me so much of the days when computers were just crap compared to what they are now. But with software, we can find creative things and created value. So that was a, uh, you know, I think that it's one of the reasons that on our business cards and on our website, we say we're creativity cures. Taking a limited set of tools and limited knowledge in these areas and finding value that can be created. And that's what we've always been focused on. And it's really about the these uh, genetic constructs of which we've done thousands that are sitting in our freezers and we can redeploy them any time for anything. So my wife wants me to stop. What, are you in a hurry to get home? No, <laughs> no I'm, I'm holding you guys long. So I should, um, yeah, I should wrap it up. Um, what I'll do is this. First of all, I brought you guys some gifts for being so patient and listening to the whole thing. Or anybody that wants an AGT cap, uh, feel free to come up here and get one on your way out. I'm happy to stick around. I don't have anything else going on this evening, so if people have more questions, I'd love to sit around and, and tell you more about this. And I really appreciate your attention. I think there's a revolution going on in, in pharmaceuticals. Hopefully this will sort of alert you to it, and, and hopefully you guys can think about being part of that. Uh, you know, if uh, you, you are coming here to graduation, and, give up this incredible weather on this coast and maybe come to Maryland. Think about us. <laughs> We're always hired. Uh, thank you very much.